I've been building stuff my whole life and just kind of followed my interests, not my passion. It was my interests, what kept me interested. And then what I'm a big energy person. So like in the beginning, you know, you have to put a ton of energy in to make something work always, yeah. but if it's going to work, what I found is at some point it starts giving you energy back. Welcome to the show, Shannon. It's great to meet you. I know it's our first time talking. Um, yeah, it's good to meet you too. I was looking at Thanks your background. It seems like you start. Yeah, my pleasure. I was looking at your background. It looks like you started a thousand different things. I'm sure. Yeah, man. I'm sure, you've uh, got some lessons to share. Yeah, I think maybe you just hit it. The key is to start. You know, it's to just get in the water and get 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 your hands dirty, get wet, and just jump in and learn. Uh, that's the only way I've ever done it, you know? Um, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, I've had a, I've continued to have a great time. You know, I've, I've been building stuff my whole life and just kind of followed my interests, not my passion. It was my interests, what kept me interested. And then what I'm a big energy person. So like in the beginning, you know, you have to put a ton of energy in to make something work always, yeah. but if it's going to work, what I found is at some point it starts giving you energy back. Right. And it's like this flywheel thing. And man, I, I just, I'm addicted to it. Just, yeah. there's, no, there's no other way to say it. Oh, I get it. I've, uh, yeah. I, the way I've always imagined it is you're like, you're pushing the, a giant boulder and the boulder is so big. And at first you're just leaning into it and you're yeah. pressing it with your shoulder and it's not moving and you go and you get like a two by four you stick it at the bottom of it, you're yep. pushing on the two by four and then all of a sudden it starts moving and then you put your shoulder back into it and you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. And at some point this giant rock just starts slowly. Yeah. Turning, it's true. You know? Yeah, it does that. And I use this slingshot analogy because I talk to a lot of younger entrepreneurs now that I've got more gray hair than everybody. And I always say, you know, it, it's like a slingshot, right? You're just, you're just pulling back like in your twenties and your thirties and you're just pulling and pulling and pulling, but like eventually you get to let go and then it exponentially rockets your life into really where I never thought I, I, mean, I never imagined in, in the ways that it's it, when I got, for me, it was really in my forties that I finally got to the other side of the grind and, and, you know, everything changed and it was great. It was awesome. And I finally felt like I could say, Oh, I was right. <laughs> I was right. After, you know, 20 years of battling and being different and, everybody going, what are you doing? You know, but it finally worked out. Now I get to hang out, do whatever I want. And all my, you know, most of my friends are like, I can't go on a Wednesday. I can't go to Napa on Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> and so we get to go. So it's cool. Uh, where do you guys live? I live in the Bay area up in the town called Lafayette. Okay, yeah. cool. I grew up in San so Francisco we, uh, my whole life Nice. Um, in the city and then uh, moved down to LA for a girl that I, uh, that I met on the internet actually. And, we, nice. we dated back and forth and then I ch chased her down here and, and now we're married. That's so awesome. That's the out. way. That's a great story right there. Yeah. That's sweet. I love it. I, um, I've chased my, my wife everywhere too. So. Oh, good. It's good. Good. I, um, I want to double click on the, the kid topic that you brought up earlier. Cause I think it's one that's really interesting. Um, you know, you, and, and similar to me, you have the direct impact of your mother's experience and your grandparents experience, right? living yeah, through the depression in the sure. U S with not much food on the table. And I'm sure in some ways that drives you, it certainly drives me. And one, th I don't even have kids yet, but one thing that I think about way more than I should for somebody that who doesn't, who doesn't have kids is like, how do I impart that same energy or like wisdom onto my kids, you know, in a world that is wonderful. Like I live in Los Angeles. My life is amazing. Yeah. You know, I've never wanted for anything. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to hear how you think about that. Yeah, it, I, it's, a, it's just a good, great question. And, you know, like for me, I, I really, I'm, I'm just trying to keep it super simple. And like, I worked really hard when I met my, my girlfriend who became my wife and I was trying to impress her, right? Just trying to impress her, build something. Hey, I'm going to do this. And I've never worked for anybody since, you know, I was in college and I'm going to build this company. Just I'm really working hard to show her that I could do it. When you had, and that's great. It was a huge motivator. It still is, you know, I still am trying to hustle to impress my wife, but when you have kids, it's like 10 X time, you know, when they're little, yeah, you just got to be there and everything else. But once they get like sharp and they know what's going on, 
they're watching you 24 seven. And so we, we maybe did it differently. People say leave business at, at the, well, at work or whatever. We brought our business home. We had no, there was no alternative. I mean, mm-hmm. we were just immersed in our companies as we built them. And so we talked about them all the time. And I talked to my, my wife is, you know, awesome. And I would talk about the problems. She didn't work for our companies for about the first 10 years. And then I went to start a new business with a partner and he said, the only way I'll do it is if your wife comes and runs it, it, was, it worked out great. But so the kids, they're watching everything you do, how you communicate with your spouse, how you problem solve. And so we would problem solve at the dinner table. I'd be like, I don't know how to raise money. How do you deal with the customer that does this? How do you, we just talked about it. It was interesting to me and it was interesting to my wife and, um, and her distance for that first 10 years, I think was really good because she would always take the employee side because she would be like, you don't know, you've never worked for anybody. These people are this, you know, she'd say, they don't want to hear your entrepreneurial BS. They, they want a job. They want autonomy, flex time. And this kind of, it's like, oh, that's right. So it gives you a different aspect. But our kids, they just were around it all the time. And they were always at our building, at our warehouse. And when a huge shipment of stuff, you know, showed up, they would see it. And like I said, you know, they always wanted to help. We just never gave our kids any money. You know, that was the thing I said earlier that my daughter, I have an older daughter, and she said, hey, I want to, I need some money. I want to do these things. Great. Let's come into work. And she was, you know, from the time she was just a tiny kid putting stickers on lollipops to help us, you know, we drop things in thank you into a box and that kind of stuff. So getting them involved and then pointing out, talking about why you get to live this kind of life and how you do it. Like, we, we travel a lot and we, and we spent millions of dollars on our credit cards and we have millions of points. So we stay in incredible hotels and, and I would always point to the back of the door that had like a rate night card. And I tell my son, I was like, Hey, look at that. How, what's the rate for this room? And he'd be like, Oh, it's 125. I'm like, no, no, there's another zero on there. And he'd be like, dad, we spent 1250 bucks. I say, no, no, we spent nothing because this room is free because of our business. And let me show you how you can do that. So talking about it all the time and being excited about it. I'm, I'm totally excited about it. I could talk about this stuff all the time. That's what got them. And they have a totally different mindset. I, I just see it from uh, other people, other people's kids. And, you know, I can tell you story after story about how they've impressed us and surprised us as young adults. And I think that's the reason why. Are you seeing any, entrepreneurial fire in them or is it too early? Are you seeing any like early indications? It's probably one of the hardest things that I've had to do was to shut up and let them do what they want to do, you know, because that was a huge gift my parents gave to me right out of college. And I didn't, you know, I went completely sideways and nobody said anything. My mom was like, great, you know, go ahead. Um, So I've tried, I've, I've worked hard to just let them figure it out. And my, my daughter's very, they're very ambitious. I, I do know that. Whether they, you know, uh, and they're they're both leaders. I, I love seeing them, you know, help lead and do. Even when my daughter was in high school and she was like, "Dad, you know, she's leading like the theater club or whatever." She's like, "All my friends, they're saying that I'm bossy." And it's like, "Well, you're the boss. You know, you you have to figure out how you can be friendly while bossing, you know, them around and and doing it in a good way." But but. Uh, I don't know. My son has just graduated uh, literally, you know, a couple months ago and he's figuring it out, but he, you know, he's moving down to San Diego and living the dream and figuring stuff out. So I'm, I'm just kind of sitting back uh, there if they, if they want my feedback, but you know, they've been hearing it for 20 plus years. So sure. If, 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 if I try to be quiet sometimes. <laughs> they need a little distance and they'll come back in a few years. Yeah. Ready for more. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And it's up to them. I, I it's been a hard, you know, I mean, we've started like 10 companies, but I probably have had that many fail, you know, and tried new things that didn't work out. So I don't, you know, I feel sorry for my wife sometimes, you know, just the ups and downs and stuff. And, and, uh, I'm, I'm really happy with risk, but it's not for everybody. So I I really want them to do what, as long as they're ambitious and they can pay their own bills, I'm, I'm very happy for them. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the risk side of, of building businesses. I mean, as I go down the list, it looks like you today own, you know, it could be five businesses. It could be more. You've started 
ResQ systems, you own a looks like a couple of short-term rentals, you're an author, you're a publisher, you're a podcast host of Business Brain. Uh, looks like you've started a few other businesses, but I want to first dig in on a little a little bit about the psyche of an entrepreneur like yourself. Like when when is it felt riskiest to do what you've been doing? Whenever I got to me, the biggest risk is being bored and that drives me a lot. I, I, I never really worried about making money because I figured that out. That part out was, or I figured that part out where like was in college and, you know, get that age, how to, how to, fl I was flipping cars, flipping construction equipment, doing those kinds of things. So I always felt like oh, I can make money. It's not a big deal. Building wealth is a whole different conversation. And like my wife is better at that, but taking big risks, like with money, just never seemed like a big risk. It, I was, it's like, I could always figure it out and I could always push into the next thing. Um, but I've also always had partners in, in these businesses to help offset my weaknesses, which I have many that you have to manage that risk with your partner, just like with your spouse It's the same kind of thing. And so you can't just be a pirate 24 seven. There has to be some modulation, I think. And, and in my experience, even if, you know, I've already made the decision that we're going all in, we're, we're going to just push, push in all the chips. We're going to do this deal. You have to let other people come to it that you're working with or, oh, or it doesn't work. You know, you quickly alienate and they think you're nuts. And, but I had enough success going all in and taking a lot of financial risk, not like, you know, yeah, just financial risk that when I got the money back, now maybe we didn't, you know, it, it never quite turns out the way you think, but we got our investment back and there was always some Delta. Okay. Well, how much did we make? And what did we learn? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, I, my first, like, you know, we, we sold iPods, you know, like tens and tens of thousands. And my first forte into learning how to deal with iPods was to buy like 5,000 store returns that, you know, from Apple. I was like, well, how do we do this? I don't know. Let's, let's buy this stuff. And, and, you know, I don't know any other way to do it. I'm just, I, again, very simple. It's like, I, I, I want to understand where the market is and what the buy side I've made all my wealth on the buy side and with relationships with suppliers mm. that I treat like they're my customers. They're the most important person to me because the profit is in the buy, not in the sell. It's totally backwards on what most people think. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. So what, what was your first, what, what felt like your first legitimate business, you know, beyond, Hey, I'm flipping, you yeah. know, a car or some parts yeah, on the yeah. internet here or there. Yeah, it, it was out of, right out of college. I started this company, Mac Rescue, and I kind of thought I wanted to. I was in the the construction business. I was a landscape construction guy. That's why I went to college. I went to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and oh, so you were I like learning that. the architecture side and the design side to build out yeah beautiful backyards. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I was running the business because I had I wanted to make money, and so we were. It was weird because. I, all my buddies that wanted to go, I was like, Hey, we can all work together. Um, but it turned out they didn't really want it. They just wanted to work for me. They didn't want the responsibility. And so I was like, okay, great. I'll run the company, figure it out. Let's do it. And it worked out great. Got, wanted to get into technology. Really. I fell in love with the Mac. It, it made me, I was, you know, I was young and inexperienced, but it made me look so like polished and smart when I was presenting to clients, you know, and, uh, like Jerry Maguire, I was good in the living room, but this really made me look great. And so I could charge 75 grand for a backyard and, you know, I was just a kid. And so I thought, you know, if this product changed my life this much, it's going to change the world. And it has. And so I wanted to start a business having to do with the Mac. That was my whole thing. Nobody would hire me because I didn't know anything. So I volunteered at this company. I just said, just let me just come in. I, I can sell stuff. Let me help you out. And, and it did it. And I learned a lot. And with another buddy of mine, we started this company called Mac Rescue, came back up to the Bay Area. You know, and I just thought it would be this small, maybe a repair business, whatever. But then, you know, it was, we rode the, like Charlie Munger says, you got to find the wave. And we just got up right on when the, the web started and the internet started. 
and you know, before, I mean, it didn't, took us like six months, a year, and we were doing like a quarter million a month, me and my buddy, selling the main business with parts. We figured out the parts part of things that the, I, I couldn't buy Apple stuff. Nobody would sell it to me. Apple was super tight, but I could go to auctions and I could buy all kinds of stuff that Apple stuff, but maybe some of it didn't work. So we had to take it apart and the parts turned out to be very valuable because nobody could get them. And so we just put the rock on the gas pedal and ran that company. You know, it was great. I mean, it, it, we went 10 years before we finally merged with another company in the Midwest trying to, everybody else had kind of figured it out. So we needed to cut costs and do all this kind of stuff. But I learned a tremendous amount of how to do it and not, and how not to do it and how managing employees and all that stuff that goes with it. So that, that was really our first, my first one. Were you guys repairing the products as well, or you guys were just pulling out the parts and kind of shipping people the parts to their home? Uh, we were repairing stuff as well as we, we we eventually just kept building out a repair division because, you know, the beginning we didn't know how to fix anything, but I started hiring people and it's like, okay, well, can't just recycle all this stuff. There's money in it. So then we start, in addition to the repair business, we started a repair business or, or in addition to the parts business, we started the repair business and that was its own division. And then by that time I'd figured out how to buy and refurbish whole systems. So we started that and then that led us to other things. So we just kept pushing out. I just wanted to work with the Mac. That's really what I wanted. And it, and it, it worked. And I've done that for my whole life, you know, and, and uh, it's been an amazing, amazing ride. It sounds like the, um, at least a couple of the key insights that you've had as an entrepreneur. One is the ability to sell. Cause I heard you say, I'll come in here, I'll sell something for you. And then two, the ability to kind of understand what the value of something is maybe when you're buying it, did that just come to you naturally? Did you like develop that or did you just make some mistakes overvaluing something and it, it blowing up for you? How, how, how is that? I've, I've definitely made those mistakes. Uh, yeah. but, I think it's just research. How good are you? Or how good are you at researching? And how good are you at working the phones to talk to people? And you know, now much of it is very transactional. But for much of my life, it was very relationship driven with suppliers that I would talk to. You know, all the time. What do you got? Let's do some something like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I learned early on how to how to figure the delta out. It didn't matter what the product was. It was okay. Um, I could buy these power supplies. This guy's got an extra hundred, and he's not very good at researching, obviously, because I just did a few, you know, an hour of research, and I can sell those for, you know, one hundred and fifty bucks, and he wants to sell them to me for thirty five dollars. Okay, let's buy those. And so, you can just do that over and over and over, and it doesn't even matter what product it was. You know, it was just okay. What is it? In, it you know, do, do this over and over and find somebody that'll pay the, what the Delta is. I, uh, I saw on, on this note, I saw that you wrote a book about how to become a successful seller on eBay, um, which was a big thing for me when I was a kid. Cause I used to go and find oh, kind of like funny. used parts somewhere that I would sell on eBay, make a buck. That was kind of my first entrepreneurial spark, right? Like how do I take something that costs me nothing or very little and sell it? Um, do you think, are you, are you still like a power eBay user? Do you think it's still a good place for people to make money? I, what's going on with it these days? Yeah. You know, eBay changed my life, man. I mean, they, it, it opened up the world literally to me, you know, some of the biggest deals in my life I've done are from people I've made on eBay. I've been in, you know, I've met all these executives. I've spoke at their conferences and stuff. And, and I'd been in a, you know, was in their 20th anniversary commercial and every business I've had has had some kind of eBay component because it's, that's where the customers were to buy stuff. You're like, well, you know, you could build your website and drive traffic and do SEO and pay-per-click and all that. Great. But we also should be selling on eBay. Just like right now, you should also sell like on Facebook marketplace or on Poshmark or on whatever. Th those are, they're paying massive amounts of money to get the, that audience. And so, and, and it's, eBay is the greatest AB testing ground in the world for products, especially unique products or weird stuff like parts or collectibles or, you know, this kind of stuff. And so it doesn't matter what you, what you have, you try it out and, and research, you know, they, uh, I used to 
use their, it was called Terra Peak and they eBay bought it and they've combined it into their platform now. But I spent hours searching Terra Peak and I just do it backwards. Okay. What, what's the most popular thing selling and you know, what's, what's the best velocity and okay, great. It's just, how do we go find, how do we go buy that? You know, th there's the business like right in front of you that you can still do it today. And I tell kids and young people that want to start and, you know, put it on eBay, man, find out that's the true market. Right. And there's all these other marketplaces now, which I think are great. TikTok shop and Poshmark. You know, I built a almost a $4 million business on Poshmark after I sold my last business. Wow. I was just bored. I was like, well, let's, what, what can I sell that's completely different than electronics that people get emotionally? The, the trouble with technology, people used to be emotionally emotion about it, but, but and I could lean into that more, but not as much, it, you know, there's not as much margin left on anymore. Hmm. But so I just stumbled into this. I'm like, I'm going to sell what's, what's social commerce. I didn't know what it was. I had guests on my podcast talking about it. And I was like, I don't, I got to figure this out. And so I, after I sold tech restore in 2017, which was my last big company with a bunch of employees and stuff, I vowed, I'm not going to sell anything with a cord, a power cord anymore. Ever. I'm out. I'm out. I've done it. I've, I've squeezed it so hard. So I was like, you know, what if I sold handbags, which I know nothing about? I, you know, I, I bought my clothes at Costco, right? And I just, but I took those same concepts that we've just been talking about. I swam upstream, tried to, you know, figured out the market, tried to sell things, got involved in Poshmark, you know, started moving bags, found, took me about eight months to find a really good supplier. It just never gave up. You get your teeth into it. And then yeah. So over a few years, you know, I, I sold a million dollars on Poshmark and then they called me and they're like, who are you? You know, but it was a great because I was like a shark in, in a, a bowl of goldfish, right? Cause I've been competing for tiny margins and trying to get attention and focused on customer service and incredible product uh, photography. And I was competing against people selling stuff out of their closet. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was awesome. And so they invited me to their place and I met the CEO and talked with them. And then I did some consulting with them and, and then they invited me to participate in their IPO. So you just never know where this stuff is going to go. You know, wow. um, it was awesome. It, 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 it gave me a lot of energy back because it was brand new. I didn't know anything about it. You know, I, I was selling to women. So every picture of me, I posted, I had my wife in there. So I, I wasn't being dishonest, but I was trying to build credibility that way. Sure. So when they, they sent me an email and invited me to their building and I showed up and they were like, who is this dude? I think I had a beard <laughs> at that time. It was great. It was fun. I had a great time. So I, that's the kind of stuff I love to figure out, you know, and, and see how you can, how you can push reality, right? Yeah. It's not realistic that I could build a business selling high end two, $3,000 designer hats. That's totally ridiculous. <laughs> I, uh, we looked at a software that, that we basically looked at a business that provides software for um, like thrift stores, the Goodwells, oh, yeah. et cetera. And I don't know anything about the, I mean, I shopped at them as a, when I was a kid, I sometimes shop, shop at them now, but I don't know anything about the thrift store industry. But through that process, I basically learned that there's this massive industry of what are called pickers. I'm sure you know something about this where they go to Goodwill. Goodwill doesn't have a website or they kind of do, but like nothing is updated on there. So yeah. they go to Goodwill, they go to thrift stores and they pick out, you know, they know what items are expensive. They'll find a pair of boots that's selling for $180 on Poshmark that they yep. can get for 10 bucks at Goodwill. And it. they make a whole living off of it. And it, apparently it's like all across the country and these people oh, are yeah. touring the stores every day because new stuff's getting dropped every day. And it's yeah, a really it's, big business. Yeah. I mean, Cody Sanchez talks about boring businesses. There's no business more boring than that. But there are people that are paying their mortgage, putting their kids through college, all this stuff. I love it, man. I have a ton of respect for the hustle and the grind and the, okay, I got to get my hands dirty, but you know what? I'm going to make six figures this year selling those boots or whatever. And there's a whole group of people that, you know, I, as I got involved in Poshmark and met more and more people, there's people that even that there's ways to bypass and buy the stuff before Goodwill even gets it to their store that they mm. figured out another unfair advantage. You know, I just, I have a ton of respect for it. And, you know, there's a ton of smart people out there, but I think often perseverance wins, man. Totally. 
I'm such a big believer in that. I'm not the smartest person, but I will run yeah. through walls uh, until, Me too. <laughs> until there's nothing left. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you know, one thing that I noticed recently, because, you know, we have a pile of stuff that goes to Goodwill all the time. And I'm curious if it's the same up by you. Let me know. Basically, all of the local thrift stores run out of space every single day. So if I show up there at like 2 p.m. or later, they just close their doors on me. It doesn't yeah. matter what I'm bringing. Sometimes they ask me kind of, what are you bringing? But after 2 p.m., they're, they've all shut their doors. They have way too much stuff coming in. And there's like a whole park. I look around and there's like a whole parking lot of people just like me who, who are like, yeah. hey, I have a bunch of like nice stuff that I want to drop off. And yeah. I, I wonder if that's an LA specific problem. Um, but if it's not, I'm curious, like what, what do you think the opportunity is? We have it up here too. We, yeah. we have the same thing. And I think what keeps people from like doing other stuff, there's another group that I really like. It's called buy nothing. I don't know if I'm sure you have down no, in LA, but buy nothing one. is a group. Uh, it's, it's location based. Each city hell have buy nothing groups that they, they do it on Facebook, but Buy nothing basically is people giving things to one another. Instead of donating it, they go out, they just post a picture. Hey, if you'd like this, I'll leave it out in a box on the curb or you come pick it up at my house. And, you know, uh, my wife is crazy about it. We have this rule. You have to give away three things to everyone that you bring in, you know, and, but I've gotten like a hot tub for my kid's frat house. And wow. we, I gave away uh, 3,000 baseball hats because baseball hat business sucked. And I was like, somebody want these, you know, I'm not going to deal with it, but the, I, I, it is that same problem up here. I think it's more, uh, you know, I don't know, just the demographic, you know, I'm, we're here in the Bay area. It's ridiculously expensive. LA, same thing, San Diego. I bet you all those places max out and it's just manpower because, you know, they're, Goodwill, their whole purpose is to give people jobs, right? Sure. That's their that's their mission and they're awesome. But it's not like they're the most efficient people in the world. And I imagine the systems are not really powerful uh, that they're processing all this stuff. You got some dude here. Yeah, here's my bag. You know, I'm always like, put everything in black bags because I don't want them questioning, you know, what it is. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But I, I don't know. It's uh, there's some opportunity there, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I'm sure sometime between two and eight p.m. There's millions of dollars of goods every week that people yeah. just want to drop off all across yeah. the country. Hey, would you take that, it? Yeah, I mean, if yeah. you parked a truck out there that you called, you know, overflow or something like that, uh, yeah. you, you certainly would fill it up. That would be what a hack. <laughs> and and I saw one family that was doing that. They had like a sign. They were kind of standing across the street and they were like, but they, you know, they wanted very specific things. Oh, yeah. Um, but still somebody's, somebody's doing it at least Dude. on micro scale. I, I, yeah. I, I too love it. Um, yeah. those are great opportunities. So it seems like you've got a bunch of different businesses under your purview. What, what's your favorite business right now? What are you, what are you kind of excited you know, about? What's working yeah, well for I, you? What's causing the least amount of headache? We'll talk about the other side later. Well, that, yeah, there's always headaches, but I've always wanted to productize my knowledge, but I never got to that step. It was always, I always got sucked back into the actual physical product business of shipping something. And I like shipping stuff. And, and I, you know, for better or worse, I've always measured my, sense of self-worth in business, how much I shipped every day. I just can't get past it. I know it's not good, but that's just the way it is. And physical so goods, right? Not yeah, like digital physical. goods doesn't check the box no. as much. Physical, I, don't, I don't know anything about physical goods. Yeah. I mean, the only, or, or digital goods, I, I tried to start a software company and it led me to publishing my first book. So that's a, that's a whole nother story, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm doing, making good progress at productizing and digitizing my knowledge. You know, I, I want to share it with more people. I want to give back. I love jumping on discovery calls. And, you know, when your guy sent me that text, I'm like, oh, that's Charlie Light. That's that's Hunter Cold Call. That's no way that's true. <laughs> you know, and I love that Legend. building. Yeah, it, it, I, it was amazing. And so I started building on X like in January just to figure it out. Like, you know, maybe this is something for me. And I got involved with a good group of people. And so you know, I had like 400 followers and my, now I have like just about, I'm coming up on 15,000 followers in 16, nice. six months. And so it's been, I'm shocked at how many people are interested in these stories that we're sharing and the lessons from them. And, you know, I talk a lot about having a, what's your unfair advantage, but when I was a kid, my unfair advantage 
uh, was my age because everybody was like, let's help this kid out. Look how ambitious he is. And I got the bid or I got the job because I was just like a little, you know, puppy jumping every mm -hmm. year. Well, now my, I, my unfair advantage is age two ways. Now I'm the old guy with gray hair. I never thought I would be the old guy, but in every group, entrepreneur group, you know, everybody's like, oh, I want your life. And I'm like, well, I'm like 20 years ahead of you, dude. You're going to have my life. You will, but I can help you. So, you, so I'm, I'm building something. I don't really know what it is up there. Um, but, you know, I started the newsletter, have a thousand or so subscribers that have come on board in the last month. And I hired a content manager to work with me and do this stuff. So I'm having a, the time of my life, really, uh, being up there talking about this stuff. I could talk about this all day long. Every conversation I get on, I go, you know, we could record this. This could be a podcast because people want to know. And yeah. it's that, uh, you know, I, I just, I've done it. I've been there. And so I have the benefit of telling my story in reverse. That makes me sound much smarter than I really am. And it's wonderful. Who doesn't like telling stories about their life successes and failures? I mean, I've made a ton of failures and, you know, I think, talking about your failures often connects you with people more, you know, deep on a deeper level than just talking about how successful, how, look how great I am. You know, nobody, people get kind of tired about that. You can ask my wife. So, uh, yeah, so that's my main focus right now on building. I've got some real estate, I've got some stuff in development, but that's okay. That's just nuts and bolts, um, stuff. And, uh, that's, that's what I'm working on. What, what do you think it's going to look like here? So I see you're posting on Twitter quite a bit. That's how we got connected. Yeah. Um, which is amazing. I mean, the power of Twitter has oh, completely man. changed my life and my business, by the way, it's how I've met a lot of my business partners, investors. We've made, we've done deals yep. that we've identified on Twitter. It's just, it's, it's, Same. it's a crazy place. It um, is. It is. What, what do you think the, the education sharing is going to look like? Are you thinking? Yeah. So I've, I've or email product? Yeah. I've got I've th the email thing is take is done really well. You know, like I say, picked up about a thousand followers. I'm learning all the terms, lead magnet, this, that, the other, you know, all these things. And for me, it's, it reminds me of when I started the social commerce business with the handbags. I'm just the, like in kindergarten here. And so all these new things, I'm just like, how can I not know this? You know, how, how do I not know how to do a 280 character hook? You know, when I first started writing, I was like, I don't even know what that word meant. And I can remember when a guy was like, Hey, are you, are you in the DMS and are you doing discovery calls? And I was like, what's a discovery call? <laughs> I don't know what that is. And so now I do them every day. And so it, it's, I'm learning. It's a lot, a ton. And so now the thing that's been the most popular on my account is the deals talking about the auctions or buying, you know, I have a, I call it my side hustle. You know, I, I've done about $8 million in high-end watches over the last seven years, but I don't know anything about watches. It's just, uh, it's just, it's a side hustle for me. So I talk about that. Here's that. And here's, here's the framework that made this work. And then, or here's the auction that is work. Like I just, just before we came up here, you know, I posted about some, you know, silly target uh, liquidation truckload of these Megalodon shark monster trucks. And I'm just like, you know, it's $23,000 worth of shark monster trucks. I don't want that but it's a hundred dollars. Right. And it's going to sell for not much more than that. And I'm just like that somebody's going to make money on that. Right. And so I share lots of these deals and buying auction store returns from Costco and stuff. And people really resonate with it. I could do this out of my garage. I could do it. So I feel really uh, fortunate that folks really enjoy that. And so, yeah, I'm going to build a community out to help them and to, allow people to maybe split up deals. You can't take a truck, but maybe you could get a few people together. Like you're talking about, you know, do deals mm -hmm. together and I could do, a, you know, a call every once in a while. And the fact that people are willing to pay me for stuff is blows, blows me away. It's cool. I mean, I, I'm sure there's somebody listening to this podcast that thinks to themselves, you know, Oh, I, maybe I should go check out the parking lot from, from my local uh, yeah. thrift store at 2 PM or, or, you know, or they think like, Oh, interesting. Like, what does happen to my parents' laptop when they want to throw it away and donate it? Like dad just got a new laptop, you know, he's got yeah. a 2024, but yep. he's got, he's sitting on a 2018. That's, you know, that's probably an 800, $600 product still. Like where, yeah. where is that going too. and yeah. why is it living in my closet, you know, or how do I get more yeah, of exactly. those, right? That's right. It, there's yeah. all you have to do is start talking. I, I post, I have a I posted this morning about, uh, I saw an auction that had a, uh, 
Bronco or Blazer or whatever it was that had the Jurassic Park wrap on it with the dinosaurs and all this stuff. And I'm just like, why aren't we buying these cars from the movies and renting them out, you know, and putting them at events? Because everybody wants, I, we had the DeLorean, the time machine in our booth at Macworld, you know, and I, mm -hmm. everybody just, 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 I mean, you had Chris Corner on your show, I think, or coming up on a show. He's nuts. Yeah. He's like exponentially out there. Him and I start talking and it's like a, a time vortex because you're just like, you could do this and you could do that. <laughs> so that's I the fun imagine. of it. Yeah. That's the fun of this. And it should be fun. You know, you, you know, that I don't believe in that follow your passion thing, but I do believe follow your interest. And, mm -hmm. and if, you know, there's way less risk doing it yourself than working for someone else. Way less follow risk. your interest when there's a high margin product involved. Absolutely. When there's a high margin. Opportunity you got it. Involved. Yeah. yeah. I want to sell. There's lots of people that are selling like, you know, ten dollar items like that. It, it takes the same amount of time to sell a ten dollar item that it does a, a hundred dollar item, a five hundred dollar item, or a thousand dollar item. So work your way up. You can start at the small items, but get yourself up into a better, uh, you know, return on your investment. It's a better clientele. They don't hassle you as much. The returns are better. You get noticed more because your volume gets higher. Work your work your way up. Don't be satisfied with the goodwill stuff. Your watch business, which you said does eight, has done $8 million. Incredible. Is it similar to the first Mac business that you started where you were like, Hey, I want to get into watches and I'm going to go do no. all the research and find out how much this thing costs or, or no, give no, us, I, give I, us the playbook that yeah. somebody could, could learn from or follow here. So I was buying uh, liquidation store returns, end of life electronics from this huge, huge company. And I've been buying them for years and, and I'm a good buyer. You know, I know the value of the relationship, so I don't complain very much. I pay on time or early. And I, I really, I, I always say treat your suppliers like they're your customers because it's kind of the same thing. They're actually often more important because if you don't have a supplier, you won't have any customers. So one day I, the guy that I dealt with calls Shannon, you know, he's complaining. I'm like, what's going on, man? He goes, oh, we just lost this buyer for this other uh, division that we have and it's backing up all this inventory. And I was like, well, what is it? And he goes, it's watches. And I'm like, like Timex and Casio. And he goes, no, like Breitling and Rolex and Cartier. And I was, I was like, huh? I go, that's weird. You know, that's kind of interesting. And he's like, well, you wouldn't be interested in that, would you? And I, I said, well, sure. Uh, oh, yeah, why not? So he said, okay, let me get you the list. You know, I'm, I only buy stuff that has a manifest because it, you just got to protect yourself. So he sent me this list and it was, it was a significant amount of money, but I thought I did some research. Like we talked about earlier. It's like, Oh, this is, I can buy it at this uh, percentage off of, of their store price. So I got on the phone and I started calling guys in the, you know, and I got on eBay and I found every watch seller on eBay, about 90 of them. I think it was 87. Nobody would talk to me. No, it's counterfeit. That's BS. You don't have this. Pro you don't own it. You're just a broker. Finally got one guy that would talk to me in New York, in the dime, in the jewelry district. And I said, hey, let me send you this list. I have this stuff in my, because I bought it. You know, I think it was $130,000 worth of product. How many, how many watches was that? I don't remember. It was, let's just say maybe about a hundred, okay. about a hundred watches. It, I mean, it, big numbers, but small, you know, it's hot. It's this stuff's expensive. It's perfect, perfect kind of product. And so I just called, he, Oh, yep. I sent him the list. He's like, you have this in your building? I said, yeah, I have it. And he goes, okay, he goes, Let me, I'll, I'll call you back. The next morning, his partner was in my office. I want to see it. This kind of Russian Chechenian big bodybuilder dude, you know, I was like, all right, come on in. And, and then he looked at it. Yep. Didn't say much. Got on the phone. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay, we'll take it. And I shook his hand. I didn't know enough to maximize the true value. I needed a strong partner that would, and that the problem was I had to buy this product every week. Like, mm -hmm. Hey, here's another quarter million dollars worth of watches. Here's 350,000. So I, I didn't have the luxury of, in, of, Oh, let me take my time. And then I could hire people and I could build a watch business. I, I did. So I said, okay, look, here's what I bring to the table, the relationship, the logistics, the financing, Let's figure out what that's worth. And I let them make the lion's share of the money, but I made a ton of money on it as well. And so they bought, we've done a lot more. That was just in the last seven years, I've done this business for a while. Uh, 
we had a handshake deal and I'm still shipping a product. I just did about, I think we did a, uh, it's a lot smaller. The watch business is devastated now. You can blame Apple and, and, and the, the watch companies are, are way more efficient at controlling the secondary markets now. I've always operated in inefficient markets, like your goodwill mm -hmm. comment resonates with me. It's horribly inefficient. The watch companies had no control at that time over what happens to a, a watch after they sell it. Now they do because they they hook the people, their, their customers into an ecosystem with a trade-in and an upgrade and a this. They're, they're very sophisticated. So the numbers aren't as big, but they're still there. We still do them. And um, I post about that and I, I use it. I say, hey, here's, you don't always have to squeeze all the money out of the deal. Let other people make money off of you can help you be wealth, you know, create wealth at the same time. It sounds like you've had a number of partners in your past businesses. Have any of those partnerships gone badly? And if so, are there any lessons that you could share with us? Absolutely gone badly. Yeah, that that's, uh, I'd say I'm probably, I'm probably about 30% that have gone in the toilet, you know, yeah. which is a pretty good, I think. And, and when I say gone on the toilet, it's not that, I've only had uh, one like that went sideways where the last time I saw this, my partner was over at arbitration, you know, mm -hmm. back and forth. But, you know, it's like a marriage. Um, and the my what I've learned is that you start off and you're both excited and energetic and I'll do this, I'll do that. And you get going. And sometimes, it, like I mentioned earlier, risk can be a problem that in the beginning, you don't think you have anything to lose. So you're like, yeah, let, let's go, you know, pedal to the metal. But after you build a company for a few years, you're just like, oh, wait, 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 we got to make payroll and we've got to pay this and we've got to do this. So some, maybe one person, their risk profile changes or your business changes always. It, it's inevitable. So at Tech Restore, which, you know, we, I ran for 10 years, Five years in, it was like we flipped. It was a completely different company, you know, and then eight years in, it was different. It's what, it's what happens. So if your partner doesn't adapt and change with you, that's problematic. Yeah. And I've had that happen several times. Um, and, you know, now I have this thing I call uh, a working agreement, which is it's not a contract. It's not a partnership agreement, but it's kind of like one where I get approached often. People would like to partner with me. Sure. And I say, great, let's talk. We do this. We'll do this. This is how it works. But I have this document that I give them that basically is a framework for everything we talked about. Who's accountable for what? Who owns the IP? How are we going to do the accounting? What you're accountable for? All these things. And what it's turned out is it's really turned into a test. That's the value of this document. It's a test because I'm shocked at how many times I don't get it back. They don't finish it. You know, and I right. say, well, that th there's a lot of people that want to be partners, but that really want to be an employee. They want to be treated like an employee, but partner, man, you're all in you. There's no guarantee that yeah. you're, you know, so you have to, it's like you get somebody to come and say, well, I need to make a uh, 10 grand a month and I want to part you. And it's like, well, there, where's the 10 grand a month coming from? <laughs> you know, you, I'll, I'll hire you. I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, so um, yeah, one thing that I recommend to, to founders that are just getting started. So, you know, people oftentimes like meet high school or college yeah, or something like that. And they're like, Hey, we have a cool idea. Like, let's do it. Let's start building together. And then they call me and they ask me, Oh, how should we split the company? You know, like, how do we split responsibilities? And I always just tell them like, you need a date before you get married, yeah, you know, absolutely. like you guys should not be forming a corporation, you yep. know, just go ahead and start working on this project and I love that, have man. the conversation amongst you today and just say, Hey, like, we're just going to work on this project and we're going to try to keep it fun for the next yep. six months. And then we'll check in like September 1st. Yeah, right. And then we'll sit down and we'll draw this thing up. But if it goes well, look, we'll split the business 50, 50 yeah. and we'll work on it. And if this fizzles in the next three to six months, like we didn't waste all that time on the contract and really the, important the energy and the expectations and all that stuff. Yeah. I know? love that. In, in my working agreement, I put a benchmark cause I, I agree with you. Why start something? There is nothing yet. You haven't created anything. So I say, I always like to say, look, once we reach these points, then we'll form some kind of whatever entity, you know, we're going to agree on. And, and that is that date before marriage, man. That, that's a, just a great way to think about it. 
Shannon, I want to ask you, I, I was listening to some of the episodes on your podcast, which I really love. The business brain, oh, like thanks. your dynamic with your co-host is so fun. I, I highly recommend time. it to people listening to this. Um, there were three topics that stood out to me kind of in recent history. I'm going to read them to you. I, I'd love for you to pick one of them, just kind of riff and tell me a little bit about what you think on it. So sure. the three topics are get comfortable with being different, which really resonated for me. What is your unfair advantage and the power of a lifestyle business? Mm. Um, grab one of these topics and, and talk. To yeah. Let, let's talk about this lifestyle business. It gets kind of a, it gets a bad rap, you know, totally. And, and I've, my whole life is lifestyle businesses, but I've stacked them up. You know, that's where people, it's not like you're just going to do it once, you know, you get it going and then, I, like, I'm really not good at maintenance. I'm not the maintenance guy. You know, I'm, you know, I want to be the zero to one guy and then the leader, the visionary kind of thing, a relationship person. So once you get your lifestyle business into maintenance mode and you have some good people around you, a good GM, an operator, get out of the way. You know, they don't, my, my wife is the first one that always told me, you know, she's like, you need to leave. They don't need you here anymore. And I was like, what? How could they not need me? You know, I was shocked. But now she's she's right. You know, and so as soon as I can, I just get out of the way. And those are lifestyle businesses. Maybe they don't make, they're not kicking off millions and millions of dollars in in net revenue every year, but you create this ecosystem that is super, uh, it's empowering. You get, you, you have a place where your employees can thrive and that's, that's a huge benefit that people miss that you get to watch them. You, they get to enrich their lives in your company. I, I take a lot out of that, man. And it gives me energy and it makes me put, I want to put more in about that because these people are really important to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can remember my first employee quit. It was devastating. I was like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> you know? And so, that don't buy into that concept of lifestyle businesses. You don't have a business, you have a job or whatever. Well, that can be a problem. You have to learn to step away. It, right. That's how you get over it and, and build a foundation. So the way I've done it is you start the business, get it going. And then when you have to replace yourself, I often take less money out because I got to hire somebody. It's like, okay, right. I'm going to hire this person. I'll take a little less, but it'll still kick out here. Then I go do something else and maybe it crashes and burns, but something, then it goes up and up. But, you know, each time it's like the chart, you know, it's like the stock market. You dip down a little bit, but then, oh, oh, and you're up here. And then as you stack these businesses up, you're building like a net. It's like your hold co company, you know, you share resources. People learn about you from one business to another. Uh, you get invited to talk at, you know, eBay or Poshmark or whatever, you get featured in articles online hmm. and then you meet other people and then you start something else. So it, it just, it builds on itself. So don't buy into this myth that lifestyle businesses are not good because they're terrific. Yeah. I, I don't know if you know this, but I grew up in tech kind of the first 10 to 15 years of my life. I was in San Francisco. I had learned about entrepreneurship. I thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread. And I started businesses. And of course, they were tech businesses. That was yeah. kind of the only, the only path there at first. And in that 10 years, I learned to poo-poo lifestyle businesses and to go for the big unicorn companies, yeah. right? And I never started a unicorn company. Um, but there's this amazing moment because I'm surrounded by tech people, people who built wonderful companies in tech. But one observation that I've had in the last five years since I've been doing this is there's this very special and beautiful moment where my tech friends get off of the tech roller coaster or the tech treadmill, perhaps. Yeah. And they stop and they focus their attention on something else. And the minute that business is generating Let's call it 150,000 of yeah. free cash flow, and they don't have to work on it every day. It's like the sky parts, glass yeah. shatters, the birds are singing, the rainbows are shining. Like, what did I miss? <laughs> yeah, they're like, What was I doing chasing a billion dollar company for yeah. all I needed was a business that does two hundred thousand dollars of income per year, which is which is meaningful, but yeah. they all of a sudden see this. Um, that's magic your foundation, thing. yeah, yeah. That's, exactly. That's that foundation. And, exactly. And, that business allows them to go work on other businesses yeah, yeah. or allows them to go on vacation with their family you got and not have to work every day. Yeah. It flips a switch in your head. Yeah. You know, once you've done it once, you're like, oh, 
I could do this again. And I could, I'm interested in this. I wanted to, I, mean, I started a company because I needed to pay for my kid's private school. And I was like, oh, I need to build a, I don't know how to build anything, but you know, I know about deals because I'm a deal guy. So we built a web-based deal site called Deals on the Web. And, you know, it took a couple of years before it started kicking off cash flow like that. But eventually, you know, I, all I wanted, all I needed it to do was make a thousand dollars a month. That was my daughter's private school. I was like, yeah. this has got to be a thousand dollar a month business. And then eventually it was making like 30 grand a month, you know? And so the, it, there's something in your brain that clicks when you make those small, I, I really believe in the power of small numbers. The, our, our country is full of people. You're taught that you got to go work for someone else to, and rely on someone else for, for your paycheck. But when they make that first hundred dollars, thousand dollars, it's a, it's that life changing light bulb moment. I, I, I could make this. And let me t it tell you, it makes you feel very worthwhile yeah. that you're completely, it's like being off grid, like, you know, I'm off grid, man. Cause I can make this money. How much do I need to live per month? Okay. 20 grand. I can make 20 grand a month. Let's figure it yeah. out. So, uh, I, I love, love lifestyle comparison. businesses, man. It's like being it's like being off grid. You're totally right. And yeah. it, and as you were talking, I realized that it takes you from a scarcity mindset where your bank yeah. account's always going down, basically, or you're kind of scrambling, to something that feels like an infinite mindset. Right? You've created yes. this source of kind of not infinite wealth, but recurring wealth or it's a wealth magic. that is likely to continue. You know? Yeah, it's magic yeah. because if yeah. you do it once, then you think. I got it. I can do it again. And maybe, uh, maybe it won't work. Okay. You're going to fail at this or fail at that. But building that over time is I can take it from somebody that has gray hair. You know, it, it's incredible reward, incredibly rewarding, especially if your family's involved in it. And you, you, I keep in touch with employees that I worked for me, you know, 20 years ago. And uh, it can be a very positive experience for you and hundreds of other people that you, you building an ecosystem. Right. And, you know, I, I, it's super rewarding financially, yeah. personally, it's, it's tremendous. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, Shannon, this was a, a wonderful intro. I'm, I'm glad that we've never met. This is such a fun way to get to know yeah, each it other. Is. It's and cool. I'm, and I'm looking forward to spending more time together. Um, how should people follow you? How should they get on your newsletter, follow you on X? Yeah, it's my name, Shannon Jean, S-H-A-N-N-O-N-J-E-A-N. -N -N Find me on X and, uh, you know, come up there and then you'll see, I'll be pitching my newsletter all the time <laughs> You can get okay. on the, on the thing. But if you love talking about deals and entrepreneurship like this, I, I'd love to have you aboard. Okay. Yeah, Wonderful. Thanks, well, yeah, thanks for great, having man. me. Thank you for watching or listening today. Any resources we mentioned during the show, we'll make sure to link in the show notes or below the video. If you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify, please leave me a review. It really helps me learn and it allows other people to discover the podcast as well. Thanks again and make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button if you haven't already. I'll see you next time.